Uh, first off, I don't think anybody has any idea of how high fuel costs can go. Um, it all depends on what actually happens. As far as blaming high fuel costs on Ukraine, um, a month ago, two months ago, before Ukraine was really even a topic, we had uh, spiking fuel prices. Uh, the spiking fuel prices, yes, currently, I mean, it's, it is part of the equation, but it wasn't the equation of, in the equation a few months ago so you know to blame uh high fuel prices on ukraine i think is it's it's obfuscation uh, obfuscation is what it is i mean do you think anyone's going to believe this that ukraine is causing all this because we saw fuel prices move up from 2020 right after the election uh, until what right. christmas when they all of a sudden used the re the uh, reserve fuel deposits to bring it back down. Do you think people are going to really believe that it's Ukraine that's responsible for all this? Well, Dave, what was the first, what was the very first executive order that Biden signed? He shut the pipelines down. So, right. I mean, no, you, you, a rational, sane person, there's no way they can believe that what's going on in Ukraine now is the reason gasoline is 350 or $4 a gallon at the pump. Do you think Biden can change this? I mean, they shut down the gas pipeline. They basically stopped the lease agreements in Louisiana and many other places. Do you think he can reverse all this if he went ahead and said, okay, you can have the Keystone pipeline. Let's have the leases for Louisiana. Can the fuel prices be brought down again if, if he reverses all that? Well, I mean, you're using the word if. Um, yeah, of course. I mean, if he reversed all the, the policy that he's put in place over the last year, yes, of course, uh, you would see uh, oil prices, gas prices, you'd see those start to soften. Now, the question is, will he reverse these things? I I think it's all part of, if you want to call it, the plan. What what plan are you talking You're talking about the Great Reset or, or the Green New Deal? The Great Reset, I mean, the takedown of the United States. What? Think about higher oil prices, higher gasoline prices, higher heating prices, uh, cooling prices in the summer. Mm -hmm. What that amounts to is a huge tax on the American public. It's a tax across the board. And what that does is it, it takes a, a, a bigger and bigger portion of someone's monthly budget. So, like I said, I think it is part of, of the plan of gutting the United States. What you're doing is you're, you're really sticking a knife into the middle class and lower class uh, part of the population. It is a, it's, it's an outright tax, and it is just something not many people have talked about, but I can remember, I mean, go back five years, 10 years, 20, 30 years, whenever oil prices started going higher, you would you would hear the financial press talking about well this is going to act like a tax on the public it's going to slow the economy down etc cetera, etc cetera. you're not hearing that now but that is still a fact that higher energy prices will will cause lower consumption in the economy so uh you add that to with what the federal reserve says that they're going to do by uh, cutting back on their purchases and basically QT. What I'm going to tell you is, if if they want, if, if they're if they want to try to save the system before the end of this year, you're going to see another episode of QE. Let's just stay on this track for a second. I mean, so fuel prices is like a hidden tax. Inflation is a hidden tax on the American public. So where are we with inflation? Okay, where are we with inflation? Because in the beginning of uh, 2021, they told us it was transient. And then, of course, they had to walk that back. And now there is inflation. Now they're talking about three Fed rate hikes. Uh, some people say two. Some people say we need a lot more. Do you think, because of everything that's happening, do you think the Fed will be able to tighten? And you're saying it, they're going to need more QE. Do you think they'll be able to tighten and raise the rates to control inflation? No. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, I think they'll raise, they'll probably raise rates once, maybe twice, um, maybe even a third time. 
but understand that the entire system is held up by credit. And if if the Fed, who basically is the buyer of last resort, if they step back and they stop uh, making the purchases, who's going to be the buyer? And what's going to happen to interest rates? You'll see a massive spike in interest rates, and you will see the credit markets literally implode because the biggest buyer, think about this. They're talking about uh, QT. They're talking about running off their balance sheet. My question is, who's going to be the buyer? Who's going to buy all of these these bonds that the that the Fed is is going to uh, liquidate or just run off? Um, I mean, who's going to step up and do what the Fed has done? And I mean, going back to 2008, you must understand that that the financial system and thus the real economy also has been on life support. So what they're saying is they're going to pull the plug mm-hmm. on life support. And I, what I'm, I'm telling you is the system is so indebted right now. The system is so fragile and unstable that pulling the plug, they're going to have to plug it right back in and they're going to have to reverse and again, begin QE. Otherwise you have pretty much an instantaneous implosion. So if they, if they can't control inflation then, because you're telling me that they're going to try the interest rate hike, they're going to try to tighten, but it's not going to work. If it doesn't work, isn't the Fed kind of trapped then? Because now, I mean, if they reverse it and they start QE again, I mean, people are going to start to realize, okay, the Fed, they can't do anything about this. They have no power whatsoever to control what's going on. Right. People should have realized many years ago that the Fed was trapped. They are absolutely trapped. And at this point, they're at this point, they're publicly trapped. In the past, you had to think it through. You had to think about the end game. You had to look forward to understand that they were tra- trapped. At this point, uh, if they do try to raise rates, if they do try to uh, slow money supply growth, if they try to, to shrink their balance sheet, then publicly, the Fed will be shown to be in a trap of their own making. Do you think inflation is the fiat-like killer or destroyer? Because when you see inflation, it really means the devaluation of their currency. And if we continually see this, doesn't this hurt their system and doesn't it benefit gold and other assets? And people, I mean, do you think this is going to wake a lot of people up? Because we've never seen inflation well, like this. Well, we yeah, we did 40 years ago, but yeah, it's well. going to slap people in the face as well to do and in think of inflation uh from from two different viewpoints one from the viewpoint of just the average guy in the street his gasoline's gone up his food's gone up uh his ability to heat and cool their home has gone up the cost of living on everything has gone up so that's one side of it the other side of it okay so they're admitting or saying Saying that we have 7.9 percent inflation, John Williams says it's 15 percent, and I would think, uh, and he does the the numbers from the way they used to be calculated back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So if inflation's even if it's just 7.9 percent, and you've got what a two a two uh, two percent ten year treasury, so what does that give you? It gives you basically uh, real interest rates at negative call it six percent and if it's if the real inflation rate's 15 percent then now you're talking a negative 13 percent so the the inflation itself will will cause less purchasing of debt you'll you'll see people liquidating debt and that will raise interest rates the 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 raising of interest rates on top of the most indebted system we live in the most indebted system in the history of history, bar none, under any uh, any way you want to measure it. We are more indebted now uh, per capita, per GDP, per cash flow, however you want to look at, at it. We're more indebted. And if interest rates start going up, how is everything bought? Everything is bought with, with credit. Mm. People buy houses with credit. People buy cars with credit. It will make it more and more difficult to liquidate a home. It'll make it more and more difficult. And it makes it more difficult because 
people's income doesn't go as far with high, higher interest rates. It'll make it harder to purchase cars. It'll make it higher, harder to do pretty much everything, anything and everything in the real economy. But more importantly, in the financial economy or the, the from the financial standpoint of it, think about the derivatives that are outstanding. Every single derivative has an interest rate assumption when that derivative is written. And if you change the interest rate assumption and, you know, for the last, what, however many years, the assumption's been 1%, a half a percent, a quarter percent, and now we might be looking at 2%, 4%, 6%, who knows? What that does is it guts that derivative. And you're talking about well over one quadrillion worth of derivatives. So you're talking about smoking the financial system is what you're you're looking at. You know, it's funny, you're bringing all this up. And I remember this is many interviews that we did a while back when we talked about freezing accounts, taking the people's money to fund certain things. And and what I find very interesting about everything that we're witnessing right now is that Canada, all of a sudden, uh, Trudeau has the Emergency Powers Act and they're freezing people's accounts. Do you think this is the beginning stages of where they're trying to bring us where they can just freeze people's accounts without asking any questions because the system's coming down? Well, that obviously is the danger of central bank digital currencies. If they don't like what you say, if they don't like what you say or do on on social media, uh, if they don't like what you uh, read on the Internet, I mean, it it could get to that point. They can shut you down. And what Canada did, and they're they're apparently trying to reverse – uh, the freezing of bank accounts, what they've done is they've basically tipped their hand. And it's it's as bad or worse if you if you want to go back, what was it, uh, three years ago, four years ago, when you had uh, Washington officials threatening, and even longer ago than that, I think it was back in 2014, you had people in Washington threatening to cut Switzerland off the SWIFT, uh, SWIFT mm-hmm. system the wire system Um, and for the last two or three four years they've been threatening to cut Russia off the SWIFT system so what did that do Russia basically has has worked and and created their own settlement system so I mean they've sold all their treasuries they've replaced it with uh, other sovereign debt and they've replaced their, their reserve partially with gold and now they have their own settlement system so by warning, by by saying this is what we're going to do, by threatening, rather than threatening, it was a warning. They heeded the warning, and now uh, I don't see how sanctions really work because they they really don't have to use the SWIFT system. Mm. Now, jumping back to Canada, what they did with these bank accounts for people who put uh, sent ten dollars, twenty dollars, forty, fifty, a hundred dollars to the trucker convoy and and these people had their bank accounts shut off what this is going to do in my opinion is it's going to create it's going to absolutely create a stampede the herd they're moving the herd and the herd is is going to just stampede and when i say stampede i'm talking about taking money out of banks buying gold buying silver uh buying bitcoin and holding in in individualized wallets as opposed to on on things like coinbase the whole idea is i i really think what they've done is they've undercut their banking system because who wants to put money in a bank where you could wake up tomorrow morning and you're frozen you got no money to pay your mortgage you got no money to pay for food you got no money to pay for anything you're stuck and i think people People are going to see what they just did, and they're going to react to it. And the reaction will ultimately, I think, be severe. Yeah, I mean, you talk about uh, the banking system going down because of bank runs. I believe when they started to freeze people's accounts in Canada, I think there were five banks that went offline because people were trying to get their, their right. funds out. So uh, I think I think when this happens, when you when they freeze your account and you try to get it out, I think at that point, it's too late <laughs> because I mean, there, there's no way to get to it. I mean, 
It's almost like if we had, I, I, if you remember back in Greece, remember in Greece when um, there was a bank run there and everyone ran to get their funds out of the banks? I think it was Greece, if my memory serves Cyprus. me. Cyprus. Cyprus, that's what it was, yes. And everyone ran to get their funds out, but they couldn't get it out because uh, they shut everything down. I, I mean, do And you- then what happened? They reopened. When they reopened, people had 30% of what they had before. Right. It was a 70% bail-in. I'm, yeah, bail in. And and it's important to remember, and we've talked about this over the years, Dave, mm-hmm. FDIC now has uh, written in code that there won't be bailouts, there will be bail-ins. So, and obviously the bail-ins, the capital for the bail-ins will come from customer accounts. So everyone believes that the FDIC, if anything ha- should happen today, they can just, let's say a bank shuts down or, or something happens to it, they can just go to the bank. Let's talk about being prepared. Concerned about the future? Join the club. Global problems are having local consequences. Too many of them. Take food shortages, for instance. Supply chains can break down at any moment. And we've all learned the hard way. That means now is the time to get yourself some emergency food from our good friends at My Patriot Supply. They're America's largest preparedness company with millions of happy, well-prepared customers. Their food lasts up to 25 years in storage. It's an insurance policy you can eat. When you need it, it will be there. Act now and save $50 on a handy four-week emergency food kit. This kit provides breakfast, lunch, dinner, drinks, and snacks, totaling over 2,000 calories a day. Every person in your family should have one of these. Go to my special website, preparewithx22.com, and save $50 on each four week food kit you purchase today that's prepare with x22.com those who know what's coming are using today to prepare go to prepare with x22.com or click the link in the description and the fdic will just say here's your money i mean is that the way it works where people you just say oh that's, go ahead. that's the way it used to work that's the way it was supposed to work what they would do is the bank would be closed for a day and then they would merge that bank with a healthy bank <clears throat> the way it stands now with what they have written uh, into, uh, I, I think it's the FDIC bylaws, I'm not sure, uh, but they've written in uh, bail-in language as opposed to bail-out language. So basically what you're looking at is the template, if you will, from Cyprus, mm-hmm. where your bank closes, you can't get your money, and it reopens in a few days, but guess what? You took a 30% hit, 50%, 70% in the case of Cyprus or more. And that's how they're going to try to make banks solvent again by, by using customer funds. And understand when you deposit money into a bank, it's not a deposit. You're loaning the bank your money. You're a creditor. You're a creditor of the bank. And just as in any bankruptcy, uh, if you own debt and it goes through a, a bankruptcy proceeding, there's a haircut. And the haircut is decided by the judge based on uh, you know, what they view the needs to be. And there's negotiations, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line is creditors don't get back 100 cents on the dollar. And you are a creditor at your bank after you give them your money. So don't expect, if your bank closes, don't expect to get all your money back. Can people just go and get 10000 15000 20000 out in cash if they wanted it? Are there still, do they still question you on what you can take out? Yeah, of course. I mean, if you're going in and asking for cash, yeah, they're going to ask every time. And especially when you go over $10,000, you got to fill out the, uh, fill out the, uh, the forms and, you know, they'll ask you, They'll ask you what it's for. Mm. And I mean, you could just say, I don't think your bank is safe. But I wouldn't just walk into my bank and say, you know, I want $50,000 because they probably don't have $50,000 in cash. You probably want to call your bank uh, manager in the morning today and tell them I'm coming in tomorrow and I want to withdraw X amount of dollars and I want it in cash. Because they, they simply don't have the cash available. I mean, if you had uh, 20 people all wanting $50,000, a million dollars, there's no way the bank has that on hand. Assuming that you did go to your bank and you did pull cash out, uh, and depending on how large of an amount, I mean, obviously, if you pulled out five or $10,000, you could probably go to a local coin dealer, give them cash and get gold or silver or what have you. But if you're talking bigger money and you've taken cash out of the system, 
coin dealers don't take cash. And that's because, you know, they're subject to the anti-money laundering laws. So if you take cash out, now what do you do with it? Mm. And it's in the form of cash. You're, you're far better off uh, making a purchase of gold and silver and wiring the funds. So let, that way you have real money in hand. So let's just talk about gold for a sec, because, I mean, if we go back in time when we had the Great Recession, gold hit an all-time high of 1900, and we're back to that point once again, where gold is, I, I think it's like 1910 or right, something like that. I mean, we're at 1900. I, I mean, do you think this is because of the inflation, because of rising fuel costs, because of the economy breaking down? Is, is that why gold is, is moving up now? Well, gold and silver have both been moving up, and I think that's a function of the demand is outstripping the supply. The reason, uh, the the reason for the weakness after the great financial crisis, while the Fed was doing uh, trillions upon trillions in in uh, loans and QE, and you know the Treasury with TARP all the way back to two thousand and eight, and then the Treasury sending out trillions in 2020 because of covid the reason metals were were not performing is is it's simple the what they what they actually did was they were selling uh paper contracts mm. derivatives that are unbacked no gold no silver behind them and what you had and still have to an extent is the tail wagging the dog the tail being the derivatives market, the, the futures market versus the dog itself, the physical market. But you are starting to see a separation now. And that separation is the premium that you have to pay to get real metal in hand. Getting real metal in hand, that's the real price. The fake. Uh, and when I say fake, think about this. If you understand that we've we we have lived through and are living through a period of time where pretty much all news is fake. Yeah. I mean, all <laughs> mainstream news, the narrative, everything that you're fed is bullshit. So if if you understand that, then why would you believe that an ounce of gold is only nineteen hundred dollars and an ounce of silver is twenty four fifty or whatever it is? It's not. You can't, you cannot purchase physical metal for that. And, you know, I've talked about this for many, many years. At some point in time, there is going to be a cash call where these contracts step up and they say, I don't care about uh, bonuses for not, for not taking delivery. I don't care about anything. I want to take delivery. And when that day comes, then then you will see uh, a failure to deliver, and then you'll see uh, you'll see the concept that that free gold has talked about. You'll see real clearing prices for gold and silver, and they will be many, many multiples of where the pricing is now. I think on uh, usdebtclock.org, I think they're saying gold. If you go back to the nineteen. 19- 11 calculation all the way back then it's something like 25 30,000 around that area i mean do you think it's going to go that high um in my opinion that when all is said and done that, that's going to be laughably low really yeah i mean you're giving too much bit to the dollar itself i did a calculation and i'm going to say this was three years ago uh when the debt was something like 22 or 23 trillion <laughs> if the U.S. had to pay their debt off with the gold that we supposedly have and hasn't been audited since 1956. So you got to trust that that gold is actually there, mm-hmm. and I highly doubt it. But based on their numbers on the gold that we supposedly have versus the debt that we had at the time, the number was $87,000 uh, $87, an ounce. And it's well over $100,000 an ounce now if you had to fund just the on books debt of $30 trillion. And I say on books debt because if you look at all the, the total promises that the U.S. has outstanding, Social Security, Medicaid, uh, Fannie Mae, Ginnie Mae, just all the guarantees, it's over $200 trillion. So now you'd have to add a zero to the number basically that I calculated a few years ago. 
since gold now is above 1900 and we saw this back in uh, 2010 going into 2011 do you think they're going to use the paper markets once again to try to stop it because what happens when gold goes to 2000 or to 2500 or 3000 will they l- allow it to move up like that because what you're saying is they they need to maintain control right um, I think actually this week is quite important because we're in the uh, we're in the the period of time where we're coming up on final notice day, and I mean you can look back several years, many years, where going into the end of the month where the first notice day comes up, then you see the spreads being lifted, and what they do is they they just dump the long side, and that's you know that's how they've basically pushed the price down. So we're in the period of time in the month where gold and silver should be weak. Hmm. Now, obviously with what's going on in Ukraine, you may have extra strength um, and it may thwart their ability this month to push pricing down. Once there's a, a, a flood of delivery demand and there's a failure to deliver, then that game is completely over. Uh, I mean, I could envision, I I've, we've said this for years is that, we could envision uh, COMEX pricing, for instance, on a, on a gold contract. You could see it at $10 offered, whereas on the cash market, you could see, pick a number, 3000 5000 mm. 50000 who knows what the number is, but nothing offered. Right. So you could see that you could see jaws opening between the paper price and the physical price. And that should be a key if you see premiums expanding further than they are now, and and you're looking at historically pretty high premiums. um, If you get, you know, much bigger premiums than they are now and they they start to open further, that should be a a key to tell you that something's going on behind the scenes and a failure to deliver may not be too far off. So let me go back to our original question about inflation, about the Fed raising rates and if they're trapped and they can't control inflation and if they raise the rates and it brings down the economy or if they stop raising the rates and inflation continues on, are are people going to see this as, okay, the Fed has no way out of this. Now gold all of a sudden starts to move because of their inability to do anything about inflation because as inflation picks up just like fuel prices pick up this is going to ring alarm bells isn't it yeah and you need to bring one more thing into that equation and that's the real economy and the real economy already is starting to roll over um so you've got understand that that inflation when it first starts feels good Mm -hmm. and that was last year because your house went up 15 20 30 percent whatever yeah um there was money in the streets because of the, the, the COVID cash. When inflation first starts, it feels good. But then reality starts to bite, meaning your salary or whatever is not keeping up with the cost of, inf- with the cost of goods and the things that you need to do. And the real economy is already rolling over. It's rolling over at the same time the cost of energy is going higher. That's a tax. And the, and the inflation is going higher. That's another tax. And on top of that, the Fed says they want to tighten. I mean, I just have one, one word question, really. <laughs> so do you think the economy is going to crash or are we heading to a crash? Um, I, yeah, I think, uh, and I've said this a couple of times before, I think, sometime by the end of this year, humanity or man, if you will, is going to turn back to God because times are going to be so bad. And it it happens. I mean, just look throughout history. Um, We've, we've, we've lived in a fantasy world for 20, 30, 40 years. We've lived on a credit card. We've lived on debt and it, now it's, now it's caught up to us and it's, it's time to pay it back can't be paid back so to answer your question yeah i i I think you're going to see an outright uh collapse of the financial system and the core of that is not i mean it would be included with the stock market but the core of that is going to be the credit markets i've said that all along 
is that the credit markets will burst. And when the credit markets burst, distribution of goods will not happen because credit is used in everything that's made, everything that's transported, everything that's delivered. The world does not, the, the, the real economy does not work without credit. So uh, you're talking about like the supply chains, like we're seeing now where there's problems. This is just going to be multiplied. Oh, it's going to, the supply chains that are already wobbly are going to mm. be crushed. Wow. And I, and I just want to mention, um, I mean, I, I obviously hear all the time the question you asked, how high do you think gold's going to go? How high do you think silver's going to go? And then you get the question, when do you think it's going to happen? I just want to say, be careful what you wish for. Because a hundred dollar, two hundred dollar, thousand dollar silver, you're talking about a Mad Max world. Hmm. You're not talking about a world where, oh, I'm rich. You know, let's go out and spend a thousand dollars on dinner tonight. Well, it may be more than that because of the inflation, <laughs> but I mean, there's not going to be places open to to get a nice dinner. Hmm. I mean, you're going to be scraping for for rice and beans. Hmm. 